about computational imaging from uh, leading experts uh, in the world. And today we have uh, with us uh, Ori Katz uh, from the Hebrew University. He's an associate professor at the Department of Applied Physics at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem in Israel. He received his PhD in physics from the Weizmann Institute in 2011. And then he did his uh, postdoc uh, studies in Paris, uh, working on optic and photoacoustic imaging in complex media. He is leading an advanced imaging lab, uh, focusing on the challenge of high resolution imaging and sensing in complex scattering media. He combines physics and engineering and utilizes tools from uh, several different uh, disciplines, including optics and acoustics. So, uh, and today he will talk to us about imaging with the scattered light. So uh, please uh, go ahead, Ori. All right, so thanks Raja for the, the kind invitation. Very happy to uh, be virtually here. Uh, can you see my cursor on the screen? Yes. Yes, okay, perfect. So what I'd like to uh, talk about is to present some of our recent works and works of our colleagues uh, that use scattering, which is usually considered a problem or a hurdle for imaging, especially in complex media, such as the inside tissue or through fog. So how to use scattering, or sometimes you can use scattering to get more information about the sample that you're probing, sometimes even imaging information. And the way that we do that in, in, in some of our recent talks is by using speckles, speckle patterns such as this one, which is the pattern that you see when coherent light is scattered off surfaces or through uh, scattering media. And not only that they are random, but they are also dynamic. And uh, uh, this is a, as a, usually a source of noise, but in our case, we use it as a source of information. Uh, so, let's, so let's start. So why speckle? So first speckles are almost everywhere. Every time you shine a, a coherent light through a, a piece of tissue or, or a scattering rough surface, such as this uh, uh, frosted glass window or, uh, or a wall uh, or through a fiber. So you would see these speckle patterns. They are, uh, usually you, you work hard, uh, for example, in laser projector to uh, turn off the speckles or to, to uh, lower the speckle contrast. So they are almost everywhere. Uh, uh, and although they are random and they're everywhere, what we found that can be useful is that the, this uh, speckle pattern, these speckle grains, they are always diffraction limited. So they are, and in tissue, they're on the wavelength scale. And they can give you high resolution uh, um, information. The question is how to retrieve it. So uh, the outline of my talk would be first, uh, I'll talk a bit about, uh, just a bit about speckles. I'm not sure everyone are coming from the same field. Okay, so, so we'll talk about the basic properties and, and please uh, stop me, ask questions. So uh, I'll know where, where you are, what's bothering you. So talk about the speckle formation and basic properties. And then we'll spend a large part of a talk uh, talking about uh, how to exploit the speckle dynamics, this random dy temporal dynamics for photoacoustics, for acoustoptics, for endoscopy. And if we'll have time, we'll, we'll talk about how to exploit speckle correlations, angular correlation on the spatial scale. So temporal, spatial, let's start. Uh, so let's talk about speckle formation. How do speckles form? So for that, it's, it's uh, easiest, uh, easiest to, to look at the simulation. So what I took is a simulation from my colleague, Emmanuel Bossi. There's a scattering medium made out of uh, small point-like scatterers. This could be uh, cell structures or droplets in clouds or in fog or whatever, or, uh, or uh, you know, particles of paint in a white painted wall. And we'll shine a pulse of uh, light, a, a coherent pulse of light on the sample. Trying to, uh, this could be a piece of tissue, for example, in our case, this is one of our motivation. So you send a plane wave in free space, a wave, plane wave remains a plane wave. Wherever it hits a scattering, a scattering particle, we can even stop it for a second. If you look at the first particles, let's see if we can, each of them scatters a spherical wave, like a point-like scatterer. So each is a spherical wave, but if we continue to watch the, the simulation, wherever two waves uh, meet, there is interference. So it could be constructive interference or destructive interference, but since they are randomly positioned, 
you have random interference, you have some points which are bright, these are bright speckle points, uh, some points that are dark, these are dark speckle points, these are actually zeros, or optical singularities, which is a whole field of uh, research. And, and, and as you can see, it, it comes both in reflection, this is why clouds are white, although they are made of transparent uh, uh, droplets of water, this is why walls are white, everything that is white, a piece of paper is white for the same reason, it's backscattering. Uh, and you have the light that comes through the sample or inside the sample is a speckle, uh, is a speckle field. You see a random, seems seemingly random uh, field. And let's talk about this, uh, uh, some of the uh, properties of this random uh, uh, interference. So let's take a point, a single speckle grain. What is it? It's essentially a sum, you know, like Huygens principle. It is a sum of all of the waves that scatters and reaches this point. And since if you have a large enough sum of waves, you can consider it as a sum of random phasors. I'm talking about fields, electric fields, which uh, uh, for monochromatic light, let's talk about monochromatic light, it's the easiest. They can be represented as phasors, you know, amplitude and phase. And if you have a sum of random phasors, uh, what you have is at some points, you know, each phasor, is a small arrow in the 2D complex plane. Uh, and these phasors, sometimes by luck, they are pointing in roughly the same direction. So you have a bright spot. And most of the time, they don't point in the same direction and you have destructive interference. This is a dark uh, speckled grain. Um, and what's nice about it is that the math is very easy. There is a universal statistics. The fields are 2D Gaussian distributed, the amplitude, is uh, Rayleigh, okay, uh, intensity is exponential, and this can be, we'll later use that. And uh, what is the speckle grain size? Okay, uh, okay, the size is changing, but let's say the, the autocorrelation size or the correlation uh, grain size. And this is very similar, if you look at these uh, uh, arrows, this is very similar to a lens, you know, focusing light to a point. And indeed, for the same reason, the, the size of a single speckle grain will be the diffraction limit, as, as if you have a perfect lens here, which is the wavelength divided by sinus theta, by the numerical aperture, and it has also a, an axial extent. And on top of that, so you have universal statistics, you have the speckle grain size, which is diffraction limited, and you have very, usually in tissue, uh, you have also fast dynamics, since this is interference, it's very sensitive to uh, changes on the wavelength scale, and since we have most of us as blood flowing in our veins, and this is changing the scattering and changing the, uh, uh, the output of, uh, of the waves. Uh, and essentially for our group, uh, we are interested in microscopy and deep tissue imaging, imaging deep inside tissue. And essentially if you use light to image deep inside tissue, you're always imaging in speckles because the scattering mean free path for tissue is about 100 microns or 50 microns or so, uh, every cell is scattering. So wherever you'd like to image deep inside tissue, deep is deeper than a fraction of a millimeter, you're imaging with speckles. Whatever you shine into the sample on the left, on the right hand side or into the sample, you'll have a speckle field. And this brings me to one, and this is actually the main uh, hurdle today or the main limitation today to high uh, resolution optical imaging inside tissue. And if you plot, this is from a, a fairly recent uh, review article, if you plot all of the optical imaging techniques, deep tissue optical imaging techniques on a graph, which is, this is the penetration depth, the horizontal axis and the vertical axis is the resolution. You'll see that microscopy, you know, confocal microscopes, many, you know, two photon microscope, more advanced microscope are, are roughly here. They're, they're working near the surface or perhaps a few hundred of microns deep. And they give you the diffraction limited resolution of a good uh, microscope objective. But the reason that you cannot apply microscopy, you cannot uh, get an, an optical microscopic image one millimeter deep into tissue is scattering. It's since whatever beam I put on the left hand side into the tissue, what I'll have inside is a roughly uh, diffused uh, speckle pattern that is not focused anymore. So this is why this is uh, uh, roughly a, a hard limit for microscopy but we want to look deeper than one millimeter and the state of the art technique are a technique that uh, use both light and sound. This, we'll talk about this a, a bit. These are ultrasound aided technique, photoacoustics and acoustoptics. Since ultrasound waves have a longer wavelength, they are less scattered by cells. They are uh, 
sort of scattering free at least in a one centimeter deep. And we'll usually want the one micron resolution to see cellular structure and, and subcellular structure, for example, to know if a tissue is uh, a, a healthy or there is a, a tumor, if it's malignant or benign, uh, you'll have to look at the cellular structure. So you want to have, you want to be here. And, and currently, okay, what are the gaps? So this is the optical diffraction limit that limits microscopy. And this is the sort of the hard stop of scattering, although light penetrates deeper, but it, it's not focused anymore. Uh, so this seems like a hard limit. And, and, and for the ultrasound techniques, this is the ultrasound diffraction. The wavelength is longer. It's less scattering, but also have a lower resolution. It's in the acoustic diffraction limit. But actually we know for uh, 20 years or so that the optical diffraction limit is not a hard limit. Uh, since we have super resolution technique or sub diffraction imaging techniques that even uh, got the Nobel prize uh, in the last uh, decade that use uh, we'll, we'll talk about it, use dynamics or use uh, uh, several images, several frames to get super resolved information, information below the diffraction. And when uh, in the last five years uh, in my group, what we try to do is say, okay, you know, this is sub diffraction for optics. Perhaps the same techniques can be applied for the ultrasound aided technique, you know, break the diffraction limit and bring us to this uh, uh, desire, the spot to be deep imaging with high resolution. And we just wanted to bring these techniques to think how can we apply or import this technique to ultrasound aided technique. And what helped us in a few, in a few of our works is that the speckle grain size, the optical speckle grain, light penetrates deep, but it's not focused, but still you have these small speckle grains and this is what we'd like to do. So this is a tool to bring super resolution to these techniques and get to the holy grail of deep tissue imaging. So I'll, I'll, I'd like to show you some of our recent works and I'll explain why we are not yet here. Okay, now the, the, the challenge is still not solved. There's still lots of challenges ahead. So I'll start with the leading deep tissue imaging approach. It's photoacoustics. And what does it mean? Let's say I, I want to image a, a small blood vessels, let's say a, a microvascular tumor, which is important sometimes if you want to see a tumor uh, uh, the tumor grows around it, small blood vessels. And if you detect these, and some of the drugs actually uh, uh, are directed at these uh, uh, small blood vessels formation, if you can detect this, you can get a lot of information about what's going on inside. So let's say I want to image small blood vessels inside deeper than my microscope. I cannot look inside, cannot use a camera, but I can listen, okay? Uh, so I can shine light at a sample. Let's say I shine green light. It propagates everywhere in the tissue, uh, and it's absorbed mostly in blood. Blood is a, is a high contrast absorber for light. Uh, and this absorption of light, a short pulse of light by, for example, blood, changes for an abrupt moment the temperature, and this change in temperature creates pressure waves. And, and, and these pressure waves are sound waves that propagate freely you know, without scattering, and they can be detected by an ultrasonic detector or ultrasonic probe, which is just a set of microphones. So photoacoustics is send a pulse of light, let it propagate, diffuse into tissue without being focused anywhere. Wherever it's being absorbed, generate a sound wave, which you detect in an array of microphones. And with simple back projection or if, as opticians, this is actually a hologram. So these record really the acoustic field. The microphone records the acoustic fields. If you come from radar community, this is an acoustic radar or a sonar. And then from a single, single shot of laser light and from these uh, uh, propagated waves, you can reconstruct back an image of the acoustic sources, which in the case of photoacoustics, these are the optical absorbers. And everything is linear. Everything is linear and every pixel in this reconstructed image gives you reports back uh, on the light intensity that was absorbed in this special position. So what's nice about photoacoustics is that you have a virtual camera. This is exactly like pixels in the camera. Just these are not small pixels, small uh, uh, physical pixels. These are virtual pixels created by uh, back propagating, uh, digital back propagation of these detected fields. Um, that gives you a camera anywhere inside the medium uh, and you can use that. And there are currently systems uh, 
that are being uh, 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 used uh, in hospitals on real patients uh, for studies mainly on, on, on skin. And um, so this is a completely non-invasive technique to see with optical contrast deep inside tissue. The main challenge for micro, when we came from a microscopic imaging or high resolution imaging is that the resolution is far from being in the resolution, optical resolution of a microscope. The resolution of each pixel here is the acoustic resolution. It's just the acoustic lens or virtual lens that you created. And the question is, can we use that and improve the resolution? So the, one of the first work that we have done in, in this field was to consider a, what is the limit of the res resolution and can speckles help us? So let's look at this uh, small simulation. Let's say I have a microscopic target and absorber. Okay, this is a two dimensional target and white is absorbing and black is not absorbing. And this is the photoacoustic image that I, that I get. And, and this is clearly <laughs> not uh, highly correlated with this sample. And the reason for that, and there are two reasons for that. First, when I shine light into the sample, what really hits the sample is a speckle pattern as we've seen. So, so this would not be too, too bad. So you'll have this, the sample plus some speckles on top of that, okay. But the main limitation is that everything is convolved with the acoustic uh, impulse response or the point, the acoustic point spread function where this is the acoustic wavelength. And this could be on a hundred micron scale, even millimeter scale. And usually in photoacoustic, that's the only thing that you have. And you can perhaps do some deconvolution. We know the limits of deconvolution and so on. What we realized is that since speckles are dynamic, very easily, you take another laser shot and another laser shot, and since the medium is changing, and if the medium is not changing, you can always change the angle of illumination, and you can get many, many images. You can get a video or a large uh, uh, set of frames uh, of the same, same subject or the same object, same target, under different illumination. And this can be pretty fast. These systems are limited actually by the laser repetition rate. So this is currently and the power that you can put, the safety limits. So this can be done at, a, say, 1,000 frames per second. The ultrasonic system can work at 10,000 frames per second easily. So we get this set of frames. In each of these frames, you have the same target illuminated or different parts of the target are illuminated, so different parts of the target are active. And for us coming from microscopy, from optical microscopy, this mathematically is actually identical to say a fluorescent samples built up of fluorescent molecules that blink, okay? In each, of, in each of this image, in each of these frames, a different portion or a different subset of the, of the sample is active. And if we assume that this doesn't change for the, uh, the sample itself doesn't change, just different parts of it are active, you can use uh, many techniques that were developed for blinking fluorescent molecules to get super resolution. And, and one of them, is SOFI, Super Resolution Optical Fluctuation Imaging, uh, uh, published uh, like a decade ago by the group of Shimon Weiss. And, and the idea of SOFI is very simple. You gather a set of frames, and instead of just averaging them like the average, uh, like the average uh, physicist, you look at every pixel, not at the first moment at the mean, but you look at higher moments, for example, variance and so on. And, if the, if the fluctuation, the dynamic fluctuations are uncorrelated between different spots, and that's the same for speckle grains, it can be easily shown that if you look at it, if you analyze an nth order moment, okay, actually cumulant, but uh, okay, you look at n order moment, you'll get not the image, not the object convoluted by the point spread function, but convoluted by the point spread function to the power of n, okay? And for a Gaussian point spread function, if you look at the nth moment, you get a square root of n, a, a squeezing, a resolution increase. And indeed, let's say this is a simulation with 30,000 frames, and this is the object, this is the mean, okay, the average of this set of frames, 30,000 frames. If you look at the variance, you can see that it's a second moment much, much more uh, similar to the sample. And if you look at the fourth order moment, it's, it's even better. And this is the principle of Sophie, originally, uh, uh, developed for a uh, fluorescence microscopy, but very easily with the speckles dynamics replacing the molecular blinking on and off blinking, which is natural, you can get a high resolution sort of for free. So what's the catch? Okay, so theoretically you can get back to the optical speckle grain resolution. 
uh, and you exploit the natural dynamics that are already there with the same hardware. If there's no change in the hardware. You just take more images. So where's the trick? The trick is, uh, okay, the catch is that you need a large number of frames. So, you know, to, to calculate a mean, it's enough to take 10 or 20 frames. To calculate the uh, second order moment, you need 100 frames. And to evaluate an, a high order moment, you need a large, an exponentially larger number of frames. Uh, and, and here, just for an example, taking this simulation, instead of 30,000 frames, I switch to 2,000 frames. So you see here, 2,000, 30,000, and you'll see the second moment and the first moment don't change, but the fourth moment image is completely distorted. And this is a noiseless simulation. This is just statistical estimation sort of noise or uncertainty. So there is a limit because of the large number of frames that you need, no free lunch, which makes sense. And then we asked ourselves, so first we've done this work and we asked ourselves, can we lower the number of frames? So how can we do it more efficiently? And actually there are ways to do it more efficiently because if you think about it, a variance image doesn't take into account any mutual information between neighboring pixels. Each pixel, you just calculate its own, use its own time trace. And then uh, in collaboration with the group of uh, Yonina Eldar, uh, then at the Technion, um, we formulated this problem as a, it's a linear problem. And you can formulate it as a, as a, um, is they want to, uh, want to solve the inverse problem. So first let's look at the, the forward problem. So each photoacoustic image is the unknown object. Let's say it's diagonal matrix, uh, non-negative. Okay, it's just absorption and sometimes sparse. Okay, there, there is some structure to these targets that you look at. Illuminated by unknown speckle pattern and convoluted with the known convolution matrix, which is the uh, impulse response of your system, of your imaging system, which is, you can calibrate it very well. So this is for a single image and for an entire data set, you know, instead of having one vector, you have a large set of vectors. So you have a matrix Y, which you know, the measured images, H that you know, D, it's the object that you look for, which you don't know, but it's non-negative, sometimes sparse. And you have U, which has the unknown speckle patterns, but we know that they are, again, non-negative, and we know exactly this uh, speckle, uh, uh, statistics, uh, we don't know the exact speckle patterns. If we knew them, we, do, we would have known everything, but we know the statistics. And then it's a sort of, for opticians, it's a blind structure delimination problem. You have some structure delimination and the convolution. And uh, this is, you can find, you can try to find the object with the various algorithms. Here we use the uh, sort of variation of compressed sensing reconstruction, where we tried in short, we try to find the object that, uh, uh, the sparse object that fulfills your uh, non-negative sparse object that fulfilled your, uh, uh, our measurements. And just to show a simulation, so these are 2000 frames with noise, uh, conventional photoacoustics, just the variance, just the SOFI, uh, fluctuation imaging, just the fourth order cumulant and compressed sensing reconstruction in the same condition and which you see can very, very similar to the object. These are simulation results. And we've done some experiments with relatively sparse objects. And sometimes this is true for a blood vasculator. Okay, it depends on the target. So these are the results of conventional photoacoustics. You can see, you can barely see what's going on here. This is variance and deconvolution. And this is with a compressed sensing framework, which uh, with just 100 frames, actually uses both our, all our prior knowledge on the speckle statistics and on the system um, and uh, the fluctuations. Um, so this work was essentially taking speckles, photoacoustics and compressed sensing and putting them together. Um, another thing that we discovered is that not only that they, there's a, a analysis uh, gives you better resolution, but there is another a well-known problem in photoacoustics, which is called the limited view problem. And essentially, this is a leaf, a structure of vasculator. This is a leaf target experimental image. And since you listen only from the top, you cannot hear waves that are propagating right and left or to the bottom. And this, this, is, a, this is a challenge to see vertical structures which are sort of slits or like antennas that uh, shine or emit sound waves, mostly right and left and not to the top. Uh, from the point spread function point of view is that since this is a coherent imaging technique and the point spread function is actually 
negative and positive, okay, it's, a, it's, a, it's a not, a, a, it's not a non-negative, a, a, it's a field, it's the pressure field point spread function, everything which is elongated on the a, a axial a axis, it just disappears, just interferes to zero. When, when you analyze by variance analysis, this is what you see. Since the point spread function by Sophie is the square of this point spread function, which makes it non-negative, and it reveals all of the structures that are usually invisible in photoacoustics for free. And so this is speckles plus photoacoustics. And, but usually, so this is working in the lab, not yet uh, 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 in most photoacoustic systems. To get speckles, you need coherence, spatial and temporal coherence. And most standard or conventional photoacoustic systems, they are not uh, temporally coherent enough to produce high contrast speckles. Um, and then this would not work on a on standard laser. You need to pay a bit more for to get a, a, a long coherence, a sufficiently long coherence pulse laser. But then we realized that, you know, if these are blood vessels that we are looking at, actually you have fluctuations that are not coming from speckles. You have natural fluctuations just from the blood, the natural blood flow. And in photoacoustics, the contrast agent, what produces the signal is the absorption by the red blood cells, since they are red. And they are moving all the time. So if you shine light, if you, shine light, if you take even uh, 1000 frames per second, uh, depending on the speed of uh, the, um, the velocity of the blood or the speed of uh, blood flow uh, here, you can get, different images just by, without any speckles, just by the fact that the um, molecules that absorbed are moving. And this is the, usually, the usual images you get with the standard photoacoustics. If you average them out, you get this. If you take a high, oh, but since you have fluctuations that are uncorrelated, if you wait long enough, you can still do the same analysis, the same fluctuations. This is just variance. This is third order and in simulation, you can get to the sixth order and more. And you can get high resolution just for free, just by waiting a bit more if your, sam if your sample is static enough. And uh, uh, Bastian at the group of Emmanuel Bossi has done one experiment when they flow in a, a, a real human blood, a whole human blood, not uh, diluted or anything, in a small uh, microfluidic channels. And when you look at it from the top, you should see five channels, so five spots. But this, since they are too close together, you cannot resolve them with conventional photoacoustics. But if you take 4,000 frames and you analyze higher order moments, this is the second moment, this is the sixth cumulant, and, and, and you can clearly resolve, you get back the resolution, again, from a standard a photoacoustic system, just by the dynamics, the random dynamics of, uh, of blood flow. And in addition to, since we are in a signal processing a seminar, in addition to uh, uh, doing uh, variance or higher order moment analysis, you can you have a set of images and what we've done here, you can do all sorts of signal processing. For example, here we did spatial temporal uh, uh, singular value decomposition filtering. So you can decompose the background, the static background, the uh, small movements, the, the uh, uh, slow and small movements, which can create, uh, uh, which can completely destroy the correlations and the uh, fluctuations that come from your, the fluctuations that you look for. So there's the very rich information that you, can, uh, that you can acquire. So this is for photoacoustics. So photoacoustic is non-invasive and you reach, you improve the resolution beyond the acoustic uh, diffraction limit. How much can you improve? Depending on how much time, how many frames you can get and wh what you know about your sample, you know, how sparse your sample is, is always compressed sensing and no change in the experimental setup. Still, it requires a relatively large number of frames to get the high resolution increase. And of course, there is space for advanced compressed sensing algorithms and machine learning, to the best of my knowledge, haven't been applied in this context. There is machine learning for photoacoustics, but not for uh, this use of dynamics fluctuations. And another thing about photoacoustics is that it requires absorption. To generate sound from light, you need light to be absorbed. And, and this is a fundamental uh, barrier. So this is why you usually see blood or some other absorbers, um, uh, usually intrinsic absorbers. And we'll talk about in a second about a technique that doesn't need this absorption. And just there was a recent work just uh, uh, about six months ago by my colleague Emmanuel Bossi and his group where they applied the same technique to image in vivo. So this is a chicken embryo 
And these are the standard photoacoustics images. And this is just the variance without any machine learning or corporate sensing or anything fancy. And uh, I'm quite certain for this crowd, if there's anyone who's interested, there is lots of data sets in Emmanuel's lab and in our lab, and, and we'll be happy to share it uh, uh, and to try more advanced uh, algorithms. But uh, there's lots of information there. So what alternative technique is used to combine light and sound? It's not photoacoustic, but acousto-optic. Okay, you change the order. And uh, in a nutshell, what is acousto-optic? It's the same problem. You want to image something inside scattering medium that you cannot see. It scatters like inside fog, but light still uh, uh, gets there. So light is there, but it's just, you can focus it or see an image. So you send light into the sample. It diffuses everywhere. You have no resolution. You have a camera on the other side, but that doesn't help you. But then you put an ultrasonic transducer and you focus an acoustic wave to a specific point in the medium. Acoustic wave at the frequency of a few megahertz actually changes the refractive index in the medium dynamically. And this is by the acousto, the acousto optic effect. This modulates the light or frequency shift the light. So the light here is, uh, you know, 10 to the 15 hertz plus 80 or 40 megahertz, okay? And, and then with the holographic detection, you can detect only this phase shifted or frequency shifted light. And if I detect only the green portion of the light, I know where it originates from. And then I can scan the acoustic focus around to generate an image. So this is a sequential technique, a point scanning technique where you scan point by point. And this gives you optical contrast, but again, with the ultrasound resolution. How can we exploit speckles again in the, actually the same analog manner to photoacoustics? Um, if, you, if you look just at one point, you, you stand with your focus at one point and you record the uh, total power of the ultrasonic modulated or frequency shifted light, you'll see that this is fluctuating. And this is fluctuating since the sample is changing and the speckles that hit this portion of the medium are varying. So this is modulating at a, at a rate that can be very fast depending, it's called the correlation time, depends on the, on the sample. It can be on the millisecond time scales for blood flow and it can be longer and you can change it also on your own. Now, usually you would average that to get the best signal to noise and you'll get this image. Okay, so this is a sample and at each point you wait, at each position of the ultrasound focus, you wait and gather some temporal time trace but instead of averaging it, you can look at a higher moment as before, apply the same ideas of SOFI, fluctuation, super resolution optical fluctuation imaging, and you'll get better images. Images with better and better resolution, the higher and higher moment you analyze from the same time trace. And again, what is the highest order moment that you can estimate depends on the length of your time trace. So here, for example, I think this is around 200 frames or 200, 200 point long time trace, and you can start to see the statistical noise. This is a simulation, statistical noise in the estimation. And we've done, a, and if you don't have enough, if your sample is not dynamic enough, you can always put a diffuser in, your, in front of your sample and rotate it to, to dynamically change the speckles. Speckles are very easy to dynamically change. It's actually very hard to keep them uh, static. So this is usually not a problem, but this is what we've done in our experiment. And this is a, a, a simple experimental proof of concept when we took just a very simple sample made out of two lines, which are transparent and an absorbing portion. And you scan the acoustic focus over this line and you'll get usually, let's say the blue trace. Okay, this is conventional acousto-optic. And if you, uh, but if you look at the variance in each point, the second order moment, and you'll get this trace, okay? Actually, this is the standard deviation to have the same uh, units. You'll get a much better, a square root of two better resolution. And here for the small, the short time traces that we took, because you have to do it fast enough for the experiment to end uh, in a master thesis time or with the PhD thesis time. So you'll see there are not enough statistics to estimate the third order cumulant, but this is not a fundamental barrier. So acoustic op, Speckle fluctuation, super resolution for acoustic optics, exploit natural dynamics, no change in the hardware. It's only you get more frames and you analyze them in the right manner. And again, the, the main drawback, which is sometimes no free lunch. You, you want super resolution, you have to pay something. And here we pay with more frames. 
and there's a lot of potential for processing machine learning which we haven't uh, yet applied. I just mentioned that using stackle dynamics as a sort of structured illumination to improve imaging has been done before uh, in the context of microscopy, for example, in the, by the group of Jerome Mertz uh, more than a decade ago to improve axial sectioning, sort of confocal, quasi-confocal imaging, and by the group of Anne Santenac to get a better resolution as you do in structured illumination microscopy. But I'd like to, uh, but this has not been done before our works in photoacoustic or acoustic optics. And there's a, there's a big uh, difference uh, theoretically, there's no difference, but uh, practically there's a difference that when you do optical imaging, usually your speckle grain size is the optical diffraction limit. And this is already the diffraction limit of your system. This is the system that you're imaging with. Whereas in photoacoustics or acoustic optic, the optical speckle grain size is on the optical one micron scale, the wavelength scale, whereas the point spread function is on the acoustic wavelength scale. And this can be order of magnitude or two apart. So this is a different regime. There is some uh, advantages in the, so you can improve the resolution much, much farther, you know, by a factor of a hundred in principle. But uh, on the drawback is that you have many, many fluctuating speckles within one resolution cell, one acoustic resolution cell. And this usually gives you low contrast fluctuations. So, but this is the main, to put it into context, this is related to this, uh, uh, and this is actually where the ideas came from, from structured illumination in, uh, in optical microscopy. Okay, so this is a uh, photoacoustics and acoustoptics, but for the, both techniques, you need light. Okay, so you need light to get inside, uh, uh, inside the tissue, to get light into your sample. So this is okay, so light can penetrate here. I have some simple example, I have a laser pointer and I have my finger, so you can see my laser pointer goes through one, my one centimeter or so finger, but when you put it through my hand, you know, you cannot see through my hand because light is being absorbed, okay, scattering and absorbed. So if you want to image deeper than a, a centimeter or two, you cannot really use photoacoustic or acoustic optics uh, more than a, a few centimeters deep. If you want to image really deep you, with optics, you have to put light inside in some manner. And this is the field of endoscopy where you use a fiber, a long fiber guide to guide light from outside the body into the body and guide light back to your camera. And this is for deep, deep uh, tissue imaging. And one of the, the, the nice and elegant tools to do that is uh, what's called fiber bundle or multi-core fibers, which is a very thin fiber. It can be a hundred micron uh, uh, in diameter, which is composed of many, many, many small thousands and tens of thousands uh, 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 single fibers, uh, each of them serves as one pixel. This is just an optical relay, okay? And usually you either uh, put it next to your sample, your target, and it's just uh, uh, guides the light back. So you either really uh, touch the, the target with it, or you put some lens and you image the target on your facet. So this is usually with a fiber bundle. So target has to be adjusted to the fiber facet and all the background that is not on the facet is, is contributing to a strong background. And just as an example, this is an experimental work. We put a, just experimental result, we put a few fluorescent beads. This is, this is the image that you get through the fiber um, and when the sample is at the fiber tip, at the distal fiber tip. And when you start to uh, 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 put a, far, a sample further away, which not always you want to touch the tissue that, uh, that you wish to image, you can see everything gets blurred and you have a lot of, lot of background. And what we realized is that, you know, these fibers, uh, these, uh, uh, when you shine coherent light to excite the fluorescence through these fiber bundles, essentially, if you're not imaging on the facet, you are illuminating the sample, which is let's say the red uh, beads here, with speckles, so the green uh, green speckles here. And if you can change these speckles, which is easy by just uh, bending the fiber a bit or shaking the fiber, you can get more images and, 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 and have more frames to analyze. And, and this is an experimental image of what happens when you shake the fiber, just bend uh, gently shake the fiber at the fiber tip. So you can see maybe perhaps the modes are a bit changing in each of these fiber cores. And when you go away, move away from the fiber facet, you can see the speckles 
really fully developed speckles, obeying all the statistics that we talk about and dynamically changing when you bend the fiber. And what we realized is that we can analyze these frames even when the sample is out of focus. So it's at a low resolution, but since we have many frames with different illumination, this is again, you can, you can think about each speckle grain as a molecule that blinks on and on, on and off, a fluorescent molecule that blinks on and on, or as a structured light, a random structured light. And you can analyze, if you have many frames, instead of analyzing the average, you can look at higher order moments and get better resolution. And also for free, a background reduction, because the background, which is out of focus, doesn't fluctuate as much as what's closer to the focus. And just I'll show you the experimental images. So this is the same sample when you move it away from the probe with standard imaging. And this is what happened when you take 100 frames and analyze the second order moment. Just look at the variance and you can clearly see the beads with better resolution. Okay, which you need to compare each distance to its own with better resolution and the background really, uh, you can really reject the background. The question is how many images do you need? So this depends on the quality of your image. Again, you pay in the time for, so this is just uh, to show you how this is evolving. So this is with hundred frames. 50 frames, 10 frames, you start to see the uh, statistical noise. And again, this is very, very simplistic. Each pixel on its own time trace, uh, uh, not using the information in between pixels and just another manifestation of the use of speckles. Okay, so this was about, uh, uh, we talked about speckle dynamics and I have, I think around, uh, how much time do I have? Roger? Around five, 10 minutes. Raja is not connected to the audio, so. Uh, let's see, so Raja, just, just. Sorry, I think we have until um, 11 a.m., so like um, 17 more minutes, but that yes. I mean, could stop earlier, like in, you know, by, uh, you know, another seven or eight minutes, and then we could move to okay. Q&A. Perfect, perfect. So let me know if I'm, I have the time. On the screen, let me know if I'm, uh, just stop me <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm too long. I, I think it will be okay. So we talked about there, dynamics. There are some questions in the Q&A you can also ah, answer. Oh, I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't see any of them. Yeah, if you, if you want, you can stop and ask uh, the question and answer the questions. Or if you want, you can continue for more than so minutes let's, uh, it's and nice then answer have, all questions. Yeah, let's see. I have a few questions. I cannot see two of them. Uh, uh, Jim Finap is asking, you say the objects were non-negative, but a single speckle image field is complex value. Can you explain that contradiction? So uh, yes, thanks for the question. Uh, it's true that the field in the speckle is actually a complex field, but for photoacoustics, what we are uh, imaging uh, is absorption. As absorption is non-negative, this is the object itself. We are just, we are just looking for, we're trying to reconstruct the uh, absorption coefficient which is non-negative. And the speckle grains, we, uh, the speckle pattern that we illuminate, we look only at the intensity. So the formulation that I wrote there was the intensity of the speckle pattern, which is non-negative. And we are not really trying to reconstruct or, or, or take into account the field in any, in any form. So this is a completely, in a sense, optically incoherent technique. It's not, it's not related to the, the phases between the different speckles do not change the acoustical uh, emissions. Uh, I'll say again, if you have a field with a, a phase of zero, optical field with a phase of zero hitting an absorber here, and an optical pulse with a phase of pi hitting an absorber here, they will emit the same acoustic wave. It's, it's converted into heat in a much longer time scale than any of the uh, optical uh, uh, period. And this is converted into sound waves. So, so uh, the phase, the optical phase, is, uh, does not play any role here. Um, I'd like to see the other question, but I don't see them. Um, hey Jim, thanks, thanks. Um, okay, somebody's asking, for some reason it's cropped for me. Let's see, I'll, I'll stop the share and then I'll share again so I can see the questions. Mm, I don't see them. Hey, let's see. Anonymous if you could attendee. click on the Q&A, you Yeah, see yeah, them. now I see them. Uh, since the size of the speckles depend on the wavelength, could you use two lasers with different colors and different angles? Uh, the answer is yes, uh, you could. Uh, I haven't, uh, we haven't done anything like that uh, uh, before, but uh, certainly you can. 
uh, different angles we are using sometimes to get, uh, you will change the angle uh, to get uh, the different speckle realization instead of waiting for the sample to decorrelate and different colors we used in a, in a different context to get a, a different uh, speckle uh, patterns or different encoding, sort of spectral encoding. Uh, so uh, definitely the answer is yes. Uh, let's see, I see somebody's in the chat uh, as well. This is the Q&A. Okay, we'll, I'll continue then we'll see. I, I want to see another subject and then uh, we'll see the rest of the thing. So, uh, so we passed through uh, what I showed you up until now was using the dynamics and perhaps the uh, intensity um, uh, statistics of speckles. Uh, and I'd like to talk about now about uh, two works that use speckle correlations. Again, this is because it's a signal processing workshop and I thought it's a, it would be interesting to this audience. And, uh, and this is correlations on the spatial domain, not the temporal domain anymore. Okay, so here now everything is static. And, and the question is, uh, can you see through a thin scattering barrier with a smartphone? No photoacoustics, no, no lasers, no big lasers, nothing. You just have something hidden behind a thin scattering layer. And the surprising answer is that sometimes in some situation, the answer is yes. Okay, we'll talk about the, the limitations in a bit. And let's consider this experimental setup, a very simple setup. You have an object illuminated, spatially incoherent, illuminated by relatively narrow band light. It doesn't have to be a really narrow band. You can put a filter on your camera, but let's say here. Uh, we have a camera, just a regular camera or a smartphone camera. And in between these two, you have a thin optical diffuser, a thin scattering layer, like a frosted glass window. And what you see through a frosted glass window is a scattered, is a highly scattered image, diffused image of your object. And if you take this scat scattering layer away, you would see here the small, this is the letter X, a small letter X. So the scattering angle is much, much larger than the object. And usually, you know, you would treat this uh, image as an informationless image because everything has been randomly scattered and we haven't measured anything in advance and we don't know anything in particular about this realization of the sample. But surprisingly enough, if you take this image, normalize it, and calculate its spatial autocorrelation. Okay, so how much is the image similar to itself when you shift it? Okay, this is X and Y, spatial autocorrelation. You'll get, a, uh, you'll, get a, 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 you'll get something that is not featureless. If you plug it into a phase retrieval algorithm and ask you know, what is the object, you crop it and you ask what is the object that has this autocorrelation, it gives you back the real object behind the sample with some artifacts. And this is a single shot. You just take a single camera, the experiment is just pushing the button of your camera. This is a bit of magic. How come it works? And this is a sample that we've never seen before, okay? A frosted glass uh, window. So the trick to do that, uh, it's like, so this is a work we published uh, uh, six years, five, six years ago, and it's actually borrowed from astronomy. In a, in, in a minute, I'll talk about the, uh, the relations to astronomical techniques. And, and the trick here is to exploit speckle or speckle correlations or angular correlations of scattered light or in our fields called the, the correlations of the transmission matrix. So let's talk about this. Transmitted, the transmission matrix is what uh, uh, relates the input and output fields in a scattering sample. So how would such a transmission matrix uh, look like? So in free space, if you send a plane wave, or at a given angle, it remains a plane wave. This is a solution, uh, an eigenmode uh, of, of, the, of the wave uh, uh, equation in free space. And if you put it at another angle, it remains in that angle. So if you, if you uh, put that in a matricial form, you know, in and out, and in the in K space, in angular space, it will be free space propagation will be a diagonal matrix. You put one angle and it remains in that angle, maybe it accumulates some phase, and this is the reason why you can see me now. You know, our eye, the lens in our eye just multiplies by the right phases, whatever is on the diagonal here. And you can see the image of me, although I'm far away, actually very far away, but far away from the, from the camera. So this is free space. What happens in a thick scattering medium? You put a plane wave in and the medium scatters it everywhere to many, many angles. And so if you put about the first input angle, you get many, many output angles and since this is a field, it's also there also with random phases, random amplitude and phases. And if you put in another angle, you get another speckle pattern. Usually for a thick enough sample, you get a completely random sample, which gives you a random matrix, which is 
horrible for imaging, may be useful for, there are some patents that I, I saw for using it as a, a encoder or a, a encoder, a random encoder or for a, a encryption, where the key is a physically unclonable key. Um, but what happens, so this is not really useful for uh, imaging unless you know the matrix. Usually you don't know this matrix. But what about a thin scattering sample, like a, you know, like a piece of a scotch tape or a frosted glass window. So I have here a scotch tape. If I put it on the camera, it's very hard to see me, okay? And, and it still will create speckles. Even a thin single scattering layer will create speckles, which you can try with a laser pointer and a scotch tape at home. Uh, so, the first column on this matrix will still be random, but if you look carefully here, when I change the angle, since it's a very thin layer, it scatters the same at different angles. So what you'll have is you'll have the same speckle patterns just shifted or tilted and shifted in the far field. And if you look at the angular uh, domain, you'll see this is like a convolution matrix. You'll see angular correlation. The speckle patterns remain the same. This is isoplanatic, in a, a iso isoplanatic scattering. Um, and this can be used. So to what extent is a scattering medium isoplanatic or, a, or a, let's say tilt invariant to a, if a highly scattering medium, it's to the, there is an angular range, which is roughly the wavelength divided by the thickness. So for if the thickness is a few millimeters thick, this is not useful, but if the layers are quite thin, okay, a few hundred microns, you can still be useful for small object. And in that case, if you have this correlation, wherever it's isoplanatic, it's called in our field, the memory effect. I'm not sure it's a good name, but this is the name that was given uh, like uh, 40 years ago. And if you're within this range, the autocorrelation of their image is the autocorrelation of the object. And this, I just want to show that, and then perhaps uh, we'll be very close to the finish line. So let's consider just the math of this very simple imaging scheme. You have an object, a sc thin scattering medium in your camera, a lensless camera, the image doesn't look like the object, and the object is narrow band and spatially incoherently illuminated. So usually if it was an imaging system, a regular isoplanetic imaging system, the image on the camera without a scattering medium was the object converted by the point spread function of your lens. And usually the lens is a delta-like function, so the image looks like the object. However, in the scattering medium, the point spread function is a speckle pattern. You put a point and you get a speckle pattern. And within this memory effect range, this, it's, it's indeed isoplanatic. It's indeed a, a, a shift invariant. And so still this, uh, this equation holds just with the point spread function behaving as a speckle. So if this is your object, this is simulation, you convolve this with that, you get a very low contrast, seemingly random image, but, what we learned from astronomers, from papers that were uh, published uh, by Antoine Laberie uh, like 50 years ago, is that if you look at the autocorrelation of this image, autocorrelation of a convolution is the convolution of the autocorrelations. In the Fourier domain, it's only multiplication. So you have the autocorrelation of your object times the autocorrelation of the point spread function, of the speckle pattern. So again, the image you have, and you want to resolve the object, but you don't know anything about these two, except that the speckle pattern is a noise-like pattern. And the speckle grains are diffraction limited. And the autocorrelation of noise is uh, one over its bandwidth. You know, it's a, the wiener kinchin theory, or a, you know, it's a, if it's white noise, it's a delta function. So indeed, the autocorrelation of a speckle pattern is the speckle grain size, which is the diffraction limit, the best lens that you can get, the, 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 the focus of the best lens that you can get. And if you convolute that with the autocorrelation of the object, you get the autocorrelation of your image. So this is why the autocorrelation of image taking to a thin scattering medium, the autocorrelation of the image is the autocorrelation of the hidden object. And then just the question is, can you retrieve an object from its uh, autocorrelation? And this Jim can tell you much better than me because he was doing this before I was born. Uh, um, this is done by phase retrieval. There are many, many algorithms. Um, Actually, this is the year I was born, so maybe I'm not sure how old I was. Um, and this is this is the principle of speckle correlation imaging using spatial or angular uh, correlations. Um, and 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 it's it's a very simple technique. You take a single shot, calculate autocorrelation, phase retrieval, and for small enough objects, sufficiently small objects, uh, it works. Okay. Um, 
okay, this is actually manifestation of stellar speckle interferometry used for stars. We don't have time, so I don't want to, to look at that uh, too much. I'll just say that it works not only in transmission, but also in reflection. You have light reflected from, you have light reflected from a wall, like the wall behind me. So uh, let's say somebody is, is, is uh, standing uh, around the corner, the light from its face is scattered from the wall to my camera. The wall scattering from the wall produces the same speckle pattern as scattering through a diffuser. And the camera gets, this is an experimental image, gets this noisy image of looking at a wall. Uh, but if it's just with a sufficiently narrow bandwidth lay, uh, a light or, or filter, you can calculate the autocorrelation, reconstruct if the uh, phase retrieve it, and reconstruct objects if they are simple enough. So this is speckle correlation imaging. Uh, it's a lensless, passive, single shot, and very simple technique. Actually, you just need a camera, and that's it. It gives you diffraction limited resolution. The limitations, okay, it's, it's so simple. Again, there are no free lunch. What are the limitations? Uh, to get high enough contrast images, you need relatively uh, narrow spectral language. The field of view is small, as we discussed, it, depending on the thickness of your sample when you walk in transmission. When you walk in reflection, uh, clearly it's not uh, related to the thickness of the wall, because you know, I don't care if this wall is one meter thick or two meter thick, uh, but it's related to the, what's called the transport mean free path, essentially to what depth does the light penetrate into the white paint before it uh, before it scatters out uh, and the roughness of the wall. This gives you the limited field of view. So this is roughly the wavelength divided by the roughness of the paint. And the phase retrieval reconstruction fidelity may not always be uh, good depending on your signal to noise, contrast, complexity of the object. And this is clearly a point where machine learning or advanced algorithm can be used. And indeed in the last uh, year or so, couple of years, there are many, many works on using deep networks uh, and deep uh, machine learning to uh, first reconstruct, better reconstruct images from speckle correlography or from speckle correlations and uh, or speckle, stellar speckle interferometry and to find different correlations, maybe to exploit other correlations that are not uh, uh, stated as simply as angular correlations. For example, if you're in a different geometry or, or so, and this is a, I can recommend this beautiful work by Lei Tian, the, the group of Lei Tian, which I liked a lot, when they learned, the algorithm learned the correlations without any physical model, just by learning a set of diffusers. So there's a lot of uh, activity in this field, but still I'm not sure it's going to be very useful. It's, it's, uh, it's a great experiment to do, but I'm not sure about the uh, uh, usefulness in practical uh, scenarios. Perhaps there's one useful, uh, um, a, a scenario that you can use it is again with these multi-core fibers where essentially if your object is a bit far away from the fiber you know the top a, a long fiber behaves as a thin diffuser because the light from each core doesn't really uh, couple to the other cores it's really the model the mathematical model is like of a thin diffuser and essentially even if your object is far away even if your object is far away from the fiber and you image with enough, you just put a regular camera with some distance from the fiber, you can calculate the autocorrelation and reconstruct an object. And this is an experimental image. It's an object, a conventional image when the object is on the facet, but when the object is a bit farther from the facet, this is what you see on the facet. If you take away your camera, just take a few millimeters back, calculate the autocorrelation, you can reconstruct back this uh, digit. Okay, it works for other digits, it's also important. Um, uh, since the angular field of view in these fibers is much controlled or the correlation range, they are isoplanatic to a much larger range than um, a random, a random samples. Um, so the same thing, single shot, calibration frame, very simple. Again, limited spectral bandwidth, the contrast of the images. This is the images that you acquire and this is what you reconstruct. So, you fight with signal to noise and contrast. There's always a price. So that's mostly it. And uh, what I'd like, what I wanted to convey is that this dynamic random speckle patterns or scattering can be used as an information source sometimes, not always, uh, both in the spatial domain and in the temporal domain. 
and how you can combine light and sound and the state of the art. Maybe this is not really, compressor sensing is not a state of the art anymore, but the deep learning is also going there to get the, most of the information or to squeeze out the, the, most of the information from the data and that works in endoscopy and in microscopy. And, and that's it. I'll acknowledge my uh, collaborators and funding and thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Ori. Uh, there are two other questions in the QA, if you can look at them. Yeah, I'll look at them just, in, just a second. Let's see. I'll stop sharing, so perhaps I'll be able to. Okay, now I can see. Um, there are other so questions? I'll... Yeah, yeah, I see, I see, the, uh, I see them. Uh, higher, I'll, I'll repeat the question. Higher order moments are extremely noisy and require a lot of averaging to get useful results. What is your estimate of the number of frames needed for end order moment? Uh, excellent question, thanks. And this is true. Um, in our settings, just to give first, I'll give the order of magnitude. In our settings, we mostly use just the second moment, just the variance. And we got, and, and this is, was the practical limit. Uh, uh, we needed more or less a hundred to hundreds of images for the second moment, uh, depending on the sparsity of the sample and the number of speckled grains inside the resolution cell. But it was hundred, let's say, uh, as a rule of thumb, a hundred for the second order moment, a thousand or a few thousand for the third order moment and, and 10,000 for the fourth. And we never went uh, uh, just in very sparse samples, you can go to higher order moments. What we realized, and perhaps I have a slide on that, is that um, it depends on the number of speckled grains that you have inside each resolution cell. Because again, from the central limit theory, you have a lot of fluctuations. If you have many, many fluctuating speckled grains inside the resolution cell, they tend to have Gaussian statistics, the, the, the sum of these, the sum of these speckled grains. And Gaussian statistics have vanishingly small, uh, or they have zero uh, cumulants above a uh, tree and above. So uh, this is what you're fighting is that uh, you want to be, uh, if you have a very sparse sample, uh, you need less images than a non-sparse sample. They have a, a graph on that. Uh, I'll show it in a second. Let's see if I can share that. And then I'll answer the second question. If this was something that bothered us, and of course the referees in, in our work, uh, let's see that I share my screen. Share screen. So this is on the supplementary of one of our work. And, and uh, the uh, horizontal axis is the number of speckles in the ultrasound uh, resolution cell, oops, in the ultrasound focus. Uh, and uh, uh, this is the relative error. So you want to be on a relative error, which is small. And, and this, is, uh, this is the average, this is the mean. This is the second cumulant, this is the third cumulant. And, and, and these are the number of realizations, 200 versus 2000 realizations. So you'll see that to get a good, uh, a, a good uh, a signal to noise or a estimation error for the third order cumulant, 200 is not enough. You know, this is on the order of one. So you need a few thousands. And if you have many, many speckled gains that are fluctuating, you need more than that. So it depends on the parameters. In our experiment, uh, this is why we usually stop at the second order moment. So this is like, uh, an excellent uh, question. Okay, so, and there's another question uh, by Pi Boson. <laughs> Ori, I believe this is a viable in a controlled environment, but the Airborne Laser Lab demonstrates the consequences of free space or the environment can have a very dramatic impact on reconstruction. Uh, Bessel B. Mantena can perhaps leverage this for RF applications. Okay, so this is a question about RF applications. Um, I'm not an expert in alpha applications, but in principle, the same ideas can be used. You have speckles in radio frequency and in, in, in acoustics and in any wave phenomena that you have many, many random uh, scattering. Um, uh, yes, this is interesting. Yeah, perhaps, uh, and it depends on also on the regime of scattering. So, so you know, sometimes in the atmosphere for optics, if you don't have really, if it's not foggy, okay, if it's just the aberrating as the usual atmosphere, you won't really get speckles. You get, uh, depending on your aperture, you may get just the uh, aberrations. So what I treated here is for highly scattering samples where you get a, a large angle scattering and speckles. And this is not always the case. It's not for any 
uh, complex media, but uh, very interesting. Can, can some of these ideas can be used in RF? I don't know. I have a, I have a feeling that it, if it could have been used, it, ha it has been used. Because when you learn about uh, advanced techniques uh, in optics, and then you discover that people in acoustics have done them before, and before that people in uh, radio frequency have done them there, uh, even before. So uh, I'm not sure. Uh, what we have in optics, which is different than acoustics and radio frequency, is that we have a lot of different, for the good and the bad, um, is that in optics, it's very easy to have many, many millions of spatial sensors, which is not the case usually in acoustics or uh, RF as far as I know. But on the, time do on the time domain, we have very low resolution. Actually, we don't really measure the field. Whereas in acoustics and in RF, you really measure the field in, in ultrasound for sure. You have a lot of degrees of freedom in the measurement, in the temporal measurement, but the number of elements, spatial elements is usually low. So a standard acoustic ultrasound transducer had 128 elements, pixels, and the advanced one maybe have 1,000. But they have many, many temporal, uh, uh, let's say degrees of freedom or measurements. So it's a very interesting question. Not sure I know the answer. Okay, see, these are all the questions that I see. Okay, I can, think uh, Raj uh, is, Raj left. Or maybe he had an issue with Zoom, but um, yeah, I, think, I was hearing him uh, just uh, partly. Yeah. Right. I th I think the maybe we can ask if the audience has any other questions. Feel free to post in the Q and A, or if you'd like to speak with, interact with the speaker, we can enable your mic and do let us know, and we can do so. Okay, so um, if there are no further questions, let's thank our speaker, Ori, again. And uh, uh, thank you for your wonderful talk, Ori. We were very happy to have you at the SPACE webinar. And for the information of the audience, um, we will have the next SPACE webinar in two weeks, uh, the same time on Tuesday at 10 a.m. Eastern time in the U.S. And so it should be on May 4th. And please watch out uh, for the information about the talk um, on the space webinar website, and we should be posting that uh, very soon. And thanks all for attending the webinar, and we hope to see you again um, on the 4th of May. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.